Just an hour's drive from Kabul is Chak district, Afghanistan. As the US and NATO prepares to pull out most of their forces later this year, I traveled here to try to see what life is like in areas of Afghanistan under the rule of the Taliban. After days of negotiations through intermediaries, I was told I would be allowed in with a camera. I'm actually quite nervous. And the reason is that five years ago when I tried to embed with a group of insurgents in Helmand, I was kidnapped and I was held back for a week. I was lucky and managed to escape from them. But still, I don't hope that I will end up in the same situation. This sort of access is incredibly rare. It's also risky. This is Taliban country. Chark is a cluster of dusty settlements surrounding a small central town. The Taliban of Chark were burying their dead. One of the two Taliban fighters killed in an attack on a local Afghan army base. A lot of inhabitants from this village in the district of Char have gathered today. They're here to pay their respect. They're here also to mourn and also show that they are proud. The dead man's father was amongst the mourners. Many of the dead fighters' comrades were there, including 17-year-old Esanula, who also took part in the attack. After the funeral was over, I followed him as he went to meet a friend. I asked him to tell me what motivates young men here to fight for a movement like the Taliban. From what I was told, the Taliban and Chark are mostly recruited from the 40,000 people who live in the district. The Taliban are feared across many parts of Afghanistan, and especially outside predominantly Pashtun regions. Before they were toppled from power in 2001, and like other groups during Afghanistan's civil war, they committed horrendous massacres against civilians. When they ruled Afghanistan, they imposed an extreme interpretation of Sharia law and provided a safe haven for Osama bin Laden and his Al-Qaeda network to operate from. But in the time that I was in Chark, although it was impossible to know who in these communities supported the Taliban and who didn't, I witnessed what appeared to be, on the surface at least, civilians and Taliban coexisting. The Taliban recognize that and they can only go as far as they want if they have the support of the population and because they are um, from the communities in which they're fighting. They rely on uh, the local population to give them shelter, in many cases to give them food. Uh, to, they rely on them for funds sometimes in terms of raising local taxes. And so they need to win the hearts and minds of, of locals to be able to fight uh, NATO or uh, the Afghan forces. 
Over the several days that I spent in Char, it was obvious that the Taliban here controlled the area. While I was allowed to film openly, most of the time there was a Taliban minder with me, so it was impossible to know how honest the people felt they could be. Villagers in places like Logar are really in a tough spot. Um, they're not likely one to offer, I think, very honest opinions in general uh, when they're on camera. And there is a great deal of intimidation on either side. If you had NATO forces standing there next to them, um, I think they would also happily say that we're very pleased to have the Westerners here as well. <laughs> سابق ازیاد نشر میشد که طالبا مداخله میکرد در زندگی مردم روزگارشان هم میگفتند در دوران خود طالبا هم میتو بودند حال او گپا نیز باست My impression was that most people just wanted to get on with their lives whoever was in control of Char as long as it wasn't foreign forces Despite a member of the Taliban looking over my shoulder one older man seemed to agree The Taliban is not just waging a military war against the Afghan government. It was becoming apparent that in Charkh at least they were engaged in a PR campaign too. Allowing me in to film was doubtlessly part of that. When I arrived in Charkh, I had asked the Taliban to allow me to film them as they governed the area. I was told I could follow a senior Taliban cleric, Mullah Fazl Rahim Mujahid. With the camera rolling, he listened to a widow lodging a complaint against her stepsons. It's thought that one of the reasons that the Taliban has been able to increase its support in rural parts of Afghanistan is that they have implemented the Sharia court system. In a place where there was either no law or the legal system was corrupt. From an Afghan point of view, particularly from those Afghans who are living in the war zone, it's actually a very welcome alternative to no, no law at all. The Taliban courts do have a reputation for being much more fair than the government courts. Now, that doesn't mean that the Taliban courts are incorruptible. Compared to the government courts, this is actually a, a sort of a much more effective system. But what is also true is that examples of justice by the Taliban Sharia court system have been brutal. Adulterers stoned to death, hands are cut off. Even recent reports of beheadings have surfaced. What I was invited to see was a more mundane case. Inside the local mosque, the clerics allowed me to film a case of a man trying to claim an unpaid debt. Mm -hmm. 
Before the next case began, I asked the plaintiff why he had chosen to bring his case in a Taliban rather than government court. The defendant in this case was a Taliban member himself. He had bought some birds from the plaintiff on credit but was refusing to pay. The Taliban member lost and walked off in disgust. When I challenged him, the cleric didn't deny the extremism of the past, but he claimed they'd learned lessons and changed. Um, there's different interpretations of Sharia law, um, competing interpretations in fact, so uh, there are, you know, your experience with going to Sharia court will actually vary from village to village or from district to district. I think the government uh, judiciary system or the court system is not trusted. It's seen as corrupt. It's seen as distant as opposed to local. It's seen as slow. And those are all problems that when you have a local grievance and the people are all right there, if through a cleric or through a mosque you can sit down and impose some kind of just settlement, people actually prefer that because they get a quick measure of justice. To watch more episodes of the Emmy Award winning series Fault Lines, check your local listings or visit aljazeera.com. What is surprising about Char is that despite the Taliban appearing to operate openly, they do so right under the noses of the Afghan National Army. I was taken by a Taliban commander, Lisan, to an ANA base on the outskirts of town. From this abandoned building, he told me, the Taliban would attack the base. They tell me that the Afghan National Army soldiers, they don't move outside the base. There are 300 soldiers in the base, and the Taliban, they can move freely in the, uh, in the area around. If they get too close, they will get attacked. But as far as they stay out of approximately a 200 meter radius, they can move around in the whole area of Char. Lee San told me that the ANA shelled civilians in response to the Taliban's attacks. One Taliban member brought me to meet this family. They were not, he told me, members of the Taliban themselves. <laughs> I <laughs> Oh. 
Da Chochi, a one wagon to see While it's impossible for me to confirm the details of what happened to this family, what is true is that the war in Afghanistan has led to the death of thousands of civilians caught in the middle, killed either by the Taliban, Afghan security forces or international troops. It's impossible to know the exact figures but the UN estimates that the majority of those civilian casualties are caused by the Taliban. I had heard that the Taliban who had previously bombed state-run schools and murdered teachers were now allowing them to reopen. I wanted to see what education looked like now in Taliban-controlled Charq. <laughs> At this boys only school there was an emphasis on religious studies and the Taliban prohibits all literature and textbooks they perceive as immoral. But I was also led into a chemistry class and another class where the students were learning math. I asked the teacher a few questions. Before I arrived in Char, I had heard that some Taliban leaders had softened their stance on girls being educated in state schools. <laughs> When they held power, the Taliban severely restricted girls' education and shut down a majority of schools, mainly because of their opposition to co-education. During the insurgency, female students were attacked, teachers sometimes killed. Now in Char, under pressure to appease the local population, and as they look to regain more power in the country, they have allowed some education for the town's girls. There are some local Taliban groups who are beginning to grapple with these issues because they need, they, or they recognize that they need the support of the population. Um, also, there's a lot of resistance um, from conservative elements and traditional elements to the idea of girls being educated beyond puberty. And you have to keep in mind that in the countryside, girls are still being married off at the age of 13 or 14. And so um, the ta it's very uh, unrealistic to expect the Taliban to do any differently in, in this regard. They need to change that narrative to win more public support. So allowing girls' education, and I think it's a, basically it's a tactic to try to be more accommodating towards the local population. But given the Taliban's history and their ideology, I don't have any confidence of what it really means is their attitude towards girls. I, I'd have a hard time believing we've seen that kind of sea change. The girls here all told me that they were 11 or 12 years old. Their classroom, a courtyard. The Taliban was planning another attack against the Afghan National Army. 
While he was waiting for the fighters to gather, I asked the Taliban commander Li San about how he felt about killing fellow Afghans. I asked him if the Taliban today was changing its approach. I was driven to the outskirts of town to film a large gathering of over a hundred Taliban fighters. This was undoubtedly a show of strength for the camera. And a reminder why so many are concerned about what will happen when NATO troops withdraw later this year. As you can see, some of the commanders, they're planning the attack today. They're planning to attack an Afghan National Army uh, military base. The key U.S. war aim was to prevent al-Qaeda from being able to operate out of Afghanistan. Before they went on their raid, I asked them whether they would renounce ties with al-Qaeda, something that the Taliban's leadership has so far refused to do. Being present at a gathering of armed Taliban in these numbers was terrifying. This was potentially a prime target for a U.S. drone strike. As you can see, the Taliban fighters operate in broad daylight in the district of Chark. The NA base is not far from here, but they don't fear any attacks from them, and they move all around the city without fearing them. I was told the roads would be closed and the area sealed off by government forces after the attack. It was time for me to leave Char. <laughs> When the U.S. and NATO withdraws most of its troops from Afghanistan, the Taliban will, despite over a decade of war, still be here. The key question is what will happen on the ground after the drawdown. The answer might be that I've already seen it. It's basically already happening. A fight for power, on the battlefield with bullets and in the towns for local support. What's likely is the sort of thing continuing for the next four, five, six, seven years. Areas in which the Taliban have de facto control surrounding small Afghan army outposts and continuing to fight, perhaps not a lot of territory changing hands. And as always, civilians will be caught up in the middle. And so what we're most likely going to see is um, a stalemate, two sides fighting each other with not one side winning, um, which is not a very good, uh, it's not a good thing for peace.